thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'm really excited to have you here and to get to talk to you about banning the trophy hunting of mountain lions and trapping of bobcats in Colorado. It's a cause that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, my name is Sam Brueger. I am the Colorado State Director and CATS Campaign Manager for the Center for Humane Economy and Animal Wellness Action. I live in Grand County, Colorado, and I'm an active member of Backcountry Horsemen in Colorado, and I've also served on Rocky Mountain National Park Search and Rescue and on the Grand Lake Fire Department Board of Directors. Um, so that's how I, I interact with nature outdoors and how I've come to know cats a little bit more in a hands-on way. Um, the Cats Aren't Trophies movement is really inclusive of all Coloradans, and I want to say that that ranges from animal welfare advocates to ethical hunters, and this is a space for you, this is a community for you, and uh, we would love to involve you more in this movement. Um, so to give you some background about the work we're doing, I would love to introduce Wayne Paselli. He's the president of Animal Wellness Action and the Center for Humane Economy. He's run numerous state ballot campaigns. He's our, he's our resident expert on state ballot measures. So I will hand it over to you, Wayne. Sam, thanks so much and welcome everybody. I'm so glad to have this fantastic group of colleagues, speakers. Uh, Sam Brueger opened it up for us to talk about Cats Aren't Trophies, which is the name of the political committee that's been formed to attempt to qualify and then pass a statewide ballot initiative. So all of Colorado, all 63 or so counties, uh, we hope the people of all those counties are going to have an opportunity to participate in this campaign, and that it's going to culminate next November, the first Tuesday in November of 2024, in a vote of the people. And as Sam indicated, it's going to be a ballot measure uh, that we are now in the last stages of the process of legal review. Uh, where the state has a role in affixing a title and summary of a proposed statute, so a new law for the state of Colorado. So the legislature typically uh, does the lawmaking, but the Colorado Constitution has a provision to allow direct lawmaking by uh, the people of Colorado. And many uh, important ballot measures have been, have been put before voters, uh, some that you like, some that you don't like, uh, through this process, but it's a voice of the people. And we in the animal protection space have often found it difficult to work in the state legislature on some of these trophy hunting issues that, you know, a small set of lawmakers are aligned with the trophy hunting lobby, the Safari Club International and other players, and they're able to block sensible, overwhelmingly, uh, favorable, uh, popular uh, reforms. So the purpose to me of the ballot initiative process is when representative government fails, there's a safety valve. And that safety valve is the ballot initiative process. So the initiative is literally like citizens initiate this measure. So Sam and dozens of other people, Pat Craig here uh, with the uh, wild uh, animal uh, sanctuary in Colorado, and Carol Baskin with Big Cat Rescue, and my colleague Julie Marshall, who was an editor at the Daily Camera uh, for many, many years before joining um, Animal Wellness Action. Uh, so many people have been involved in launching this initiative petition. And it's really got three phases. First phase is to kind of formulate the measure. And as, as I indicated, this is a wildlife protection measure, and it's aimed at stopping particularly cruel, unsporting, um, inhumane, unacceptable, out of step uh, trophy hunting and commercial trapping practices. That's what we're aiming for here. We're talking about mountain lions. More than 500 mountain lions are shot by trophy hunters every year. You know, Pat's going to talk about this. He has an incredible array of big cats at his. Uh, facility. I guess it's, what, about 45 minutes outside of Denver, Pat? Um, yeah, it's just about 35 minutes out of Denver. 35 minutes out of Denver. And, you know, he has so many people who come see those cats. Uh, he'll talk about this, but they're individuals. These animals are principally 
chased down with packs of dogs. These trophy hunters put radio collars on the necks uh, of the dogs. They have a handheld directional antenna, they being the trophy hunters, uh, and they monitor the, the signal as the dogs pick up a scent of a lion and then begin to chase the lion. Uh, they can overtake the lion and attack the lion and maul the lion. The lion may be cornered and fight back against the dogs which really is an animal fighting situation. And in Colorado, it's a felony to stage a dog fight. It's a felony to stage a cock fight. This is the same sort of outcome that routinely results from this sort of interaction. But eventually the dogs, you know, because of their numbers and overwhelming uh, their quarry, they drive the lion into a tree uh, and the the refuge in the tree is illusory for the lion. He or she climbs up in that tree and thinks that for the moment they're safe. But what happens, of course, is that the dogs have a mechanism on their collars. It's a trip switch, and that signals to the hunter um, using this directional antenna uh, that, the, that the animal has been treed. And they can follow the signal to the stationary point and they can walk to the base of the tree and shoot the animal out of the tree. That to me is the moral and sporting equivalent of shooting an animal in a cage at a zoo. That has nothing to do with fairness. That has nothing to do with sportsmanship. This is a high tech search and destroy mission to kill an inedible animal for a trophy. You know, in talking about fox hunting with packs of dogs, uh, the legendary writer Oscar Wilde called it the unspeakable in pursuit of the uneatable. And that's exactly what's going on here, right? There's a different moral calculation if you're hunting deer or elk, right? If you're a meat eater, uh, if you're eating, you know, cows and beef or you're eating pork or, or chicken, you know, you are, you are, you know, using that meat as part of your sustenance. And, you know, a deer or an elk, you can make an argument, has a heck of a lot better uh, life than an animal on a factory farm. So you can make a meat-eating argument for taking the life of one of those animals. It's supposed to be done quickly. You're supposed to use the entire carcass and consume all of it. That contrasts with this lion hunting thing. They don't use packs of dogs to hunt deer. They don't use packs of dogs with radio transmitters to uh, attack and then trap an elk and then shoot a trapped animal. And almost every hunter whom I know who engages in deer or elk hunting says it's part of his or her personal ethic to consume the animal. Well, how are you gonna consume a lion? We have a national law a federal law, I worked on it in the last farm bill 2018 in the United States Congress. It's a, it's illegal. It's a federal crime to trade dogs or cats, domesticated dogs or cats for meat and to slaughter them for consumption. What's the difference between, you know, a domesticated cat and a bobcat or a lynx or a lion? They're all made of the same sinew. They're all, you know, they're all cats. They just have a little different exterior, right? Or they may come in different sizes. The moral question is the same for us. And, you know, Colorado in 1992, a generation plus ago, had an issue on the ballot having to do with bears. And it banned spring bear hunting when the mothers are coming out of hibernation and they've got cubs of the year. And if the mother is shot before September in this so-called spring or summer bear hunting season, then you kill the entire family group. You doom the offspring of the mother because the young are dependent on her. And the measure also banned baiting, where they, they set out food to shoot bears uh, while their head is in a, a barrel with rotting meat and jelly donuts and sugar and honey. And the measure also outlawed this high-tech hounding of bears. So it stopped the spring bear hunting where it led to the orphaning of the cubs and it stopped the unsporting methods. 
70% of Colorado voters favored that. In 1992, that was a generation ago before we have all these new sensibilities about animals. These are many of the exact same issues. It's hound hunting. It's attempting to bait the animals and trick the animals. And it's killing an animal who is inedible. So we have a really important moral question that we're putting to the people of Colorado. Should this continue? Should trophy hunters kill 500 plus lions a year? Should commercial trappers and trophy hunters kill 2,000 bobcats a year to sell their pelts, the bobcats pelts to China? So a tiny number of Chinese elites can wear uh, these fur coats. I mean, this is, I think, a very clear moral issue. If you care about animals, whether you're a hunter or you're an animal rights advocate, this is outside the bounds of appropriate behavior. But we have to work to get this measure on the ballot. I mean, this is not going to be easy. Uh, almost all the ballot measures that get qualified have some big multi-million dollar interest backing them. They typically pay for signatures. They hire a firm that professionally does this. They charge five or six or seven dollars to gather one signature. So if you have to gather roughly 200,000 signatures and it costs five or six bucks, you're talking one million to $1.2 million just to qualify that ballot measure. We don't have that kind of money. We don't want to waste or use that much money when really what we want to do is reserve our resources to get our message out and to show the images of what happens with these high tech unsporting inhumane trophy hunting practices and trapping of these bobcats and the bludgeoning of the bobcats. We wanna tell that story in the summer and in the fall in advance of the vote. And we don't wanna squander our resources. That's why we're gonna ask you to help us. And tonight, is, as Sam mentioned, is our first really organized meeting in Colorado to recruit an army of petitioners. And tonight we're gonna to talk about that. So Sam, I'm really glad that you and the others have organized this and I'm excited that we've got so many folks on the call tonight. And I hope that we snag you tonight. We need you over these next 11 months. This is gonna be a tough campaign, but it's gonna be a fun campaign. And it's gonna be the most important campaign that you've ever engaged in for animals. A lot of people ask me, because I've been involved in animal welfare for a long time, how can I help? You have no better opportunity than this campaign to help. You, if you're a Colorado resident, you can help us get out there and talk to thousands of people. You can get their, you can get their signatures. If you're in Utah or Wyoming, you're welcome to come join us here in Colorado and help us uh, win this campaign. This is a participatory campaign. And I know, Sam, that uh, you're you're going to be out there, and I'm sure that you'll buddy up with some folks. If people haven't done this before, and most people haven't, they can work with you, or they can work with Lauren, who's going to be talking tonight, or others who've done this before. And there's nothing magical about it. You know, it's not horribly difficult, but it involves taking a little step, step forward, raising your hand, saying, I'm going to participate. And I think, you know, we have a duty to these animals. We've got a responsibility. We have all the power in this relationship. And there are a small number of people who are hurting animals for selfish interests. And it's our duty to step in the breach. It's our duty to, to turn this around and we can do it. You know, human beings can be cruel and terrible to animals, but they can also be their saviors. They can be compassionate. This is an incredible opportunity for every one of you. Yeah, it really is, Wayne. I, I think it's an amazing opportunity. And you had touched on bobcats a bit too. And many Coloradans don't even know that traps are set out for bobcats to languish away and until a trapper checks the trap line and then kills that, that cat. And when you mentioned bobcats, it did make me think of one of our brilliant wildlife advocates who, who started out with bobcats and is the founder and CEO of Big Cat Rescue. And I think that it would be great to ask Carol, why is this campaign important to you? So Carol Baskin, I welcome to the webinar and I'd love to hand it over to you to talk a little bit more. Hey, all you cool cats and kittens. I am so happy to be a part of your pride. I'm just 
purring like a cub inside. And I know that we can get this ballot initiative passed with your help. So thank you so much for being here tonight. I'd like to share with you a story about three cubs. And it started with a call that I got from a rehabber who said that she had been um, asked by the Department of Natural Resources to take in some cubs that had been orphaned. As she relayed the story to me, she said that a trophy hunter had gone out to kill a male mountain lion because it was illegal to kill a nursing female mountain lion. The problem is that you can't tell a male from a female mountain lion or a male from a female bobcat or a male from a female Canada lynx at a distance about the only cat you can tell at a distance would be a lion. And so when this hunter shot this cat, then he realized that she was protecting a den full of cubs. And these cubs still didn't have their eyes open. They still had their umbilical cords attached. And this trophy hunter thought these would make great pets. And there's just, there's such a disconnect in the minds of people who would certainly not go out and shoot a dog or a cat, but they would shoot a mountain lion and then think they could make a pet out of those cubs. So he takes the three cubs and he's driving home and one of the cubs is screaming, just terrified, screaming for its mom. And the hunter doesn't wanna be dealing with that. So he just throws the cub out on the side of the road. And a farmer thankfully heard the screaming, came out, found this cub, didn't see a mother around anywhere. So he contacted the Department of Natural Resources and turned the cub over. They contacted the rehabber who was calling me about this. A few days later, apparently the trophy hunter was seeing that these cubs that he was trying to bottle raise to make pets out of were not doing so well. And so he took them to his veterinarian and asked her to, if she would raise the cats up for him old enough that they were weaned so that he could make pets of them. She contacted the Department of Natural Resources who then contacted the same rehabber, and now the three cubs were reunited. But a few days later, the Department of Natural Resources contacted the rehabber and said, you know, you're either going to have to send those cubs to a zoo, or you're going to have to euthanize them, because it's not legal in many states to rehab and release an apex predator. And she felt the same way about zoos that I do. I don't think that animals should be kept in cages for their whole lives. There's a difference between zoos that do that as a business and sanctuaries that are cleaning up the mess that's caused by zoos and private ownership. And I just want to give a huge shout out to Animal Wellness Action as being our partner in a very long battle to pass the Big Cat Public Safety Act, which bans cub petting and private ownership of big cats now. But back when this happened, there was no law like that. And so when the rehabber was, was presented with either having to euthanize the cats or send them to a zoo, she said she knew that I would feel the same way she did and that she wanted me to be on the phone with her while she euthanized them because she needed somebody to kind of hold her hand through that. And I said, you know, most states in this state in particular had never allowed that these orphaned cubs and there are many of these orphan cubs, like Wayne said earlier, if there's 500 cats being shot every year, probably half of those are female and some percentage of those probably with cubs. And so they've always been sent to zoos, which are great attractions at the zoos, but then you know, they become overloaded with them and then they send them to sanctuaries. So I worked with her to get the state to finally allow the cats to go to a sanctuary instead of a zoo. And they came to Big Cat Rescue. They lived with us until they were in their late teens, but, and they died of old age, but they never got to live free. And I just know that Aries and Artemis and Orion, that they, they would be looking down on every single one of you and thanking you and purring and loving you for doing what you're going to do to help protect others like them. So Thank you very much for being here on this call and all of the work that I know you guys are gonna put your, your hearts and blood, sweat and tears into to save these precious cats. Thank you, Carol. And it really is a tremendous opportunity and uh, we're really excited to take it on. 
And you did raise a really great point about how these animals are individuals that all belong in the wild that have a right to be in the wild. And uh, someone else who can speak to that is Colorado's own Pat Craig, who is the founder of the Wild Animal Sanctuary in Keensburg. So Pat, I would love for you to share about uh, why this campaign is important to you. Okay, well, thank you, Sam. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I am the founder and director of the Wild Animal Sanctuary. We've been in Colorado for and operating for 43 years now. And um, we've have about 120,000 people that visit the sanctuary outside of Denver every year. And of course we do have mountain lions and bobcats here that were part of the cub trade and, and captive born and in these roadside zoos and in people that exploited them. Um, but I'm also a native that you know grew up and, and went into the mountains and, and enjoyed the wildlife here in Colorado. And of course we have some of the most majestic animals on earth here and as well as the exotics that we deal with. But you know, Colorado is so lucky to have the wildlife that we have and and to not be dwindling away into nothing. And so it's just kind of crazy that anybody would want to hunt the mountain lions and, and the few you know predators that we have here. Um, but to do it, as Wayne explained, is just ludicrous to think that people somehow think that that's fair to these animals. You know, if somebody was to say uh, here at the sanctuary, we're going to let one of these mountain lions out and let a bunch of the dogs chase it and, and then tree it so that somebody can walk over and just shoot it. I don't see how anybody considers that to be hunting or fair or anything. I mean, it's just crazy that that's part of a, a, a process that anybody would consider to be hunting. You know, it's one thing when people go out and, and have to do just like everybody else has done for hundreds of years and track an animal and, and try to use your, you know, your own wits to, to find them and track them and then, and have a purpose to use them. And, and another thing Wayne said was, you know, it's just crazy that they're going to try to consume these animals, which is the legal precedent that they have to do that. And so, you know, we we have mountain lions here and, and bobcats, and they're amazing creatures. They're amazingly intelligent. You know, they they know people. They understand what's going on. So those mountain lions that get chased, um, they know exactly what's going on, and they know their life. They're fighting for their life. We have bears that came from what was called bear baiting, and that was a process that hunters used in many states for until it was outlawed where they would have bears and they would take their teeth and claws out and they would chain them to a wall and let these hunting dogs go over and attack them so that they would build up their confidence and that way they could go at, chase a bear in the wild and not be afraid of it. And so these bears that were in those systems that were captive, you know, their faces are scarred from all the dogs that tore at their faces and their, and their bodies to try and you know, attack the bear. And, and that's what these hunting dogs are trained to do is to chase these animals down. And if they don't go up a tree, they're going to attack them and they're going to bite them and they're going to surround them and overwhelm them. And so of course the animals are going to go up into a tree and that's their last sense of safety. And of course, then here comes some car or somebody trucks it up, you know, whether they're on horseback or on foot and they've got a rifle and they've got it all figured out. And all they do is look up, aim and shoot and drop the animal. And they think that that's somehow a great sporting thing. And and then to watch them pick these animals up, these beautiful mountain lions, and hold them like they're just so proud that they killed that animal like that. It's just unbelievable. And so, you know, we we and all of our supporters would absolutely go against this and would absolutely vote to, to get this bill going. And so we're going to work very hard to get these signatures so that this can be in front of the, the public here in Colorado. It's a, an incredibly important thing. So we're glad we're part of it. Thank you, Pat. And I, I know that Colorado is with you on that, too. I think one of the more devastating uh, images I've seen has been a hunter with a bow just at close range at a mountain lion, um, which is really, it's just, it's not acceptable. And it's a far cry from fair chase and ethical hunting. Um, I do want to point again to the Q&A. If you have questions as we go along, we're saving uh, at 15 minutes at the end for questions. So please uh, use the Q&A if you have any. And then we also have more information on our website. So um, always check out catsaren'ttrophies.org too um, if there's anything that we might have missed here. Um, we have a lot of information on the website. Uh, but I did want to start talking about some ways that you all can get involved. And I'd love to turn it over to Wayne about signature gathering and how essential it is to uh, a ballot initiative. Yeah, thanks again, Sam. Again, that's Sam Brueger. She's our campaign manager for Cats Aren't Trophies, which is the political committee that's been formed. Dozens of groups are now part of a coalition, uh, the Wild Animal Sanctuary that 
Pat runs uh, just about a half hour outside of Denver. I just want to underscore what Pat has done is incredible. He formed this organization four decades ago. It sees 120 to 150,000 people coming to that facility. It's an extraordinary facility. All of you should go if you're in Colorado and check it out. And he's protecting these animals. People come because they want to see them alive. They want to see them safe. They want to know that there's someone like Pat and all of his, his, his staff and his volunteers who are helping these animals. I mean, would anyone come to watch an animal being attacked by a pack of dogs? No, it's, hor it's horrible. You know, when we've run ads on television showing what's happening, people say, oh my God, you know, my children saw that. That's terrible you put that on. Well, if it's so terrible that your children see it, why is it permitted in the state? It should be outlawed. And this is exactly what we're doing. So Pat, I just want to say thank you so much for what you're doing and all of the work that you've done to raise awareness about this issue. We're all standing on your shoulders here in Colorado and what you've done to help these, these big cats. And Carol Baskin is, you know, she, she has helped on the national level so much and she was so instrumental in getting the Big Cat Public Safety Act done in the Congress less than a year ago. Carol, it's just about a year. Well, it's actually, it's the, uh, almost, what was it, December 8th or so that we passed the U.S. Senate on that bill. And, you know, you are so dedicated. You and Pat are probably the two most prominent big cat advocates in the United States. And no disrespect to Howard Baskin or to uh, some of the other great advocates, but we're so lucky to have you. I see you're on my screen. You're the bookends and you're the bookends of this campaign. So we're really excited to have you. But as good as you guys are, uh, you guys can't carry it alone. And I know you're here to help us recruit other people. We need hundreds of people in Colorado to be part of this campaign. Actually, we need thousands. We need, need at least 2,000 people. 2,000 people in a state with millions, right? 750,000 people in a congressional district. You got nine congressional districts in the state. So you got 7 million or so people in the state. We just need 2,000 for this next phase of the campaign. People who are going to step up. You're the Navy SEALs. You know, you're the Army Rangers who are going to qualify this ballot measure. And what it means is going out and getting signatures. We're going to have a 180-day window to gather 175,000 signatures. So that is 1,000 signatures a day for six months. And I don't know if you think that sounds like a lot or a little, but I can tell you it's a lot. And it is going to be, it's going to be a challenge. But I mean, if we had 180 people, which is really just one-tenth of that number of 2,000 that I said we need, if we had 180 people invest 50 hours of time in this campaign for signature gathering over six months, not 50 hours in one month, 50 hours over 180 days, six months, which is less than 10 hours or fewer than 10 hours a month, those 180 people could qualify this uh, effort, this ballot initiative. We're, you're going to hear from Lauren here tonight, who just working in Denver on a couple of local ballot measures in your biggest city uh, of, of, of Denver. She gathered 3,300 signatures personally over that period of time. So doing 1,000 is totally doable. I've done it in a number of states. Uh, through the years, I know one couple in Idaho to stop a spring bear hunting and bear baiting hounding measure. A couple in Idaho, which is a pretty densely, I mean, pretty thinly populated state and quite a rural, uh, you know, very pro hunting mentality. This couple gathered 15,000 signatures. It was absolutely incredible. That's the record. Um, you know, each of them, if you split it up, 7,500 each, just a remarkable commitment. But it's really just about finding the right venue and, and getting out there and putting in the hours and being pleasant and asking people to help participate in our democratic decision-making process and help animals. I mean, we have the best calling card imaginable. I mean, how beautiful are these mountain lions? 
how extraordinary are these bobcats? I mean, this is the easiest sell that there is. I mean, people come running to, to Pat's facility, right? They come from all parts of Colorado. They come from all parts of the United States just to see one of these animals. What does it take for someone to sign his or her name and put your address in? But the reality is because, you know, very few of these movements that try to qualify ballot measure have rank and file advocates like we have, they rely on these paid petitioning firms. As I said, it's five or six dollars that they charge per signature. So to gather 200,000 signatures at five or six dollars a pop, I said it before, I'm gonna say it again, is one million to 1.2 million. What if we could save all that money and put another million dollars into advertising to educate people about animal welfare? to remind them of their responsibility as compassionate people to be good to all animals. You know, there are a lot of issues on the ballot. Think of all the news coverage that results, all of the discussion about our responsibilities to animals. So this has such a ripple effect. It has such collateral benefits uh, for those of us who want to see better, fairer treatment of all animals. And I can't think of a, of a more appalling abuse when it comes to so-called wildlife management. It's not management. It's just random killing of animals by unsporting means. And these predators, so to speak, are, you know, you look at, at, at the old policies that we had, they used to kill them on site. There were no seasons, there were no limits. Yet still we have the vestiges of that old attitude by allowing packs of dogs by high-tech gadgetry, having four-month season, having a season where the, the, the cubs are still dependent on their mother and 41% of all of the lion's shot are females. You know, and the most of this happens with the aid of guides. They hire a guide with a pack of trained dogs and radio te telemetry equipment and CB radios and you know other technologies where they guarantee the fee paying trophy hunter. So the trophy hunter pays 8,000 bucks to this guiding firm and it's a no kill, no pay operation. The guide guarantees the kill and they get it every time because they know they're gonna do it because they, they've rigged the system They've stacked the deck against these animals. So the signature gathering is this next phase. We're going to worry about persuasion later. Now our task is to get the signatures. We've got to be ruthlessly practical and get out there. Going to places where there's a steady stream of people where you can have an opportunity to approach them and maybe have a picture. But it's important you're not just you know, getting a notepad and then you're going to ask them, ask them to sign your notepad. That doesn't work that way. This will be an official petition that is approved by the Secretary of State. The campaign, again, it's called Cats Aren't Trophies. That's the political committee that's going to qualify and pass this ballot measure. We'll print the petitions and you can pick them up. We'll have drop off points throughout Colorado uh, for you to drop off your your filled in petitions and you can pick up uh, the blank petitions and then you don't copy them. You just take enough from us and when you need more, we'll replenish them. And there are rules that we're gonna give you very detailed. We already have a, a sheet that kind of summarizes all the rules. You don't have to be a registered voter to circulate the petition. Uh, you can be from Colorado or you can be from Utah, you can be from New Mexico, you can come over from the panhandle of Oklahoma, uh, but the signer, has to be a registered voter. And the signer can just do this once. So if someone's really enthusiastic, they say, oh yeah, I signed that, give that to me again. You say, oh, thank you so much. Um, tell somebody else, tell a friend, because a duplicate is, gonna, is going to mess us up in terms of our counting. We need a minimum number of signatures and they need to be quality signatures, not duplicates, not illegible. So your own quality control is gonna be important making sure that someone doesn't sign twice, making sure that they fill out their complete address. You know, you someone, you give the petition to somebody, he or she signs it, 
and then they hand it back to you and they walk away. You look at it and say, oh my God, they left out the city. Sir, ma'am, can I get you back here for a second to complete that petition? You know, this is a little, this is a little um, hard to read. Can you just, you know, correct that if you would, or the pen didn't, you know, uh, press down enough? Can you darken that a little bit? Because we want to make sure your signature counts because we know you care about this issue. And frankly, not everybody needs to be a yes voter on this ballot measure. If there are people who say, listen, I'm for letting the people decide. I'm not sure if I'm going to vote yes or no. I'm going to decide that later. But I'm for giving people a chance to decide the issues. This is more democracy. And there is never a problem uh, with giving people an opportunity. So, Sam, I know you've got some petitions. Excuse me. You've got a, a, a sheet that we're going to give to everybody that lays out the details. And we want everyone to, you know, take a look at it, carefully read it, internalize those, those, those basic standards, and then realize that you're the best quality control, right? Following those rules, having a display that you're a petitioner, you've got to announce yourself. And, you know, there'll be rules on, you know, different counties. You want to get people from a single county signing the petition. There are all sorts of uh, standards. You know, someone may be visiting from Wyoming, say, oh, I'm a voter there, I would like to help. Sorry, that doesn't count. You've got to be from Colorado, You've got to be a voter. Yeah, Can and you... Wayne, so the, speaking of the rules, we do have an expert. Yes, for, thank you, ever. please. You, yeah. And I do want to say that you did say she only gathered 3,300 signatures and it was 33,000 in Denver, so. <laughs> it was for, for me personally, it was 3,300. So that was accurate. We collected about 32,000 <laughs> signatures between the two petitions for all of us, but I'll let you keep going with the. <laughs> well, this is Lauren and Lauren is, is brilliant. So that's a lot of signatures for you and for your group. Uh, Lauren is the campaign coordinator for Pro Animal Future. It's a grassroots community helping society evolve away from animal exploitation. Um, right now, they're working on two initiatives that will appear on Denver's November 2024 ballot. Um, one will ban the sale of new fur products, and another will ban the operation of slaughterhouses in the city. So 3300 for Lauren, 32000 for the org. Between the two of us, that's, I mean, that's amazing. Either way, you spit it. So um, Lauren, I'd love to have you chat with folks a little bit more about signature gathering and being a circulator. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so yeah, again, uh, as Sam just said, we just found out a couple weeks ago that we officially qualified for the ballot with both those measures. Um, over the past six months of collecting signatures, I really felt inspired by seeing how many people really do care about animals and want to see society take steps away from animal cruelty. Um, as a kid, I think this evolution is just already happening. As a kid, I grew up really looking up to Jane Goodall. Um, and her work with the chimpanzees. Um, and just, uh, you know, she was really widely criticized for giving the chimpanzees names instead of numbers um, and for treating them as individuals with unique personalities and emotions and feelings. Um, but as we've learned more about animal sentience, uh, we've found that she was 100% correct that animals basically think and feel like we do. Um, and that, you know, basically all animals have kind of this individual individuality the same as the dogs and cats in our houses. Um, and so through ballot measures, we can harness that support that people have in the general public and turn it into actual legal change for animals. Um, and so that's why I'm so excited for this community to be here and to be uh, pushing for another pro animal measure on Colorado's ballot in 2024. Um, I really think that our societies are best when we protect the most vulnerable among us. Um, and so that's the same whether whether that's a lamb being raised on a factory farm or foxes being raised in tiny cages for a fur coat uh, or big cats being tracked and killed so that someone can feel powerful putting their skin on the wall. Um, so these campaigns really can't happen without dedicated dedicated people like all of you putting in the hours. Um, this is really just a numbers game of like how many people can you have out on the streets collecting these signatures, talking to voters. Um, signature collection isn't always the most glamorous job. It can be scary for people going out and talking to strangers, um, facing those rejections and spending a lot of time outside. 
Um, but for me, it's also just been a massive opportunity to find the people who do care, um, really connect with them, have these really great conversations. Um, and on the bigger uh, side of things as well, it also uh, lets us kind of bypass government bureaucracy and inefficiency and go directly to the hearts and minds of voters and help create create real legal change for animals. Um, and so if you're feeling like uncertain, if you have questions in your mind, um, I encourage you that um, it really is sometimes good to do things that make us uncomfortable. Um, I'm sure that Sam and the rest of the CATS team will have a lot of training and support for you and help you feel comfortable so that you can get out there. Um, and when you get discouraged, just really keep imagining how good it's going to feel to see this on the ballot next year. Um, Pro Animal Future got our measure on the ballot with a team of regular volunteers, just like all of you. Um, and this really is a once in a generation opportunity to put this groundbreaking initiative directly in front of voters. Um, and so uh, Colorado really can take steps away from its legacy of animal cruelty and toward a future where, you know, our our mountains and landscapes and uh, grasslands are, you know, full of native wildlife that are out there living happy and safe and free from exploitation. So I'm really excited to gather signatures on this campaign and I really hope you'll join me. Thank you, Lauren. Lauren, let me just let, yeah, I just want to say, Lauren, that's really amazing what you did. Thank you so much for, for doing that. And thank you for showing what one person can do. I mean, it's, it's all about us as individuals, right? I mean, we, we have more power than we realize. And I bet, you know, when you're 80 and you're looking back and thinking like, what were the most important things I did in my lifetime? You'll look back and think, oh my God, I helped qualify these measures to spare so many animals. I mean, it's incredible. And I think this is going to be for everyone who participates in this campaign, one of the most memorable things that you do in your lifetime. I mean, to change the law and to spare these animals, I mean, as I said, it's 25,000 lions and bobcats over the next 10 years who won't be subjected to this sort of barbarism, this trophy hunting to kill these inedible animals, you know, to mount a head on the wall or to sell the, sell the, the pelt to China. I mean, come on. I mean, we can do so much better. We're having an evolution and a revolution in thought. I mean, used to be okay to stage animal fights. Now it's a felony. Used to be okay to have elephants in the circus. Then Ringling Brothers got out of it because people didn't want it. I mean, you know, it used to be okay to wear a mink coat and all, all these other furs. And now the big fashion houses and the, uh, the retailers barely sell it any longer because people have woken up on these issues. People are waking up. I mean, to chase a lion <laughs> up into a tree and shoot the animal on a tree and what crazy mixed up world is that okay you'll hear all this nonsense about wildlife management they don't know how many lions there are we have lions protected in california for 50 years you've got 39 million people in the state lions and people living together there are almost no attacks that ever occur almost none i mean you have a far greater chance of being struck by lightning twice than attacked by a lion so the whole thing, you're going to hear nonsense, but at the end of the day, the people of Colorado are going to make the right decision, but they're not going to get that chance unless we get it on the ballot. And Lauren, you gathered 3,000 signatures. I mean, I think we can get 100 people in Colorado to commit to gathering 1,000 signatures. I mean, Pat, I think, I think you, with the incredible organization that you have built, I think you're going to get you know, 15 or 20,000 signatures just at the wild animal sanctuary, don't you? Oh, yeah. No, everybody that comes here is, I, I guarantee you, nine out of 10, or if not 10 out of 10, would be appalled by hearing what goes on and would gladly sign to to get this on the measure. Yeah. So, so I want to ask each of you tonight to think about this. And, and I encourage impulsivity here. You know, make a commitment tonight to say, I'm going to gather a thousand signatures. Now, you may go to 2,000 or 3,000 like Lauren did, but make that commitment and let's get 100 people in Colorado. That's our base. That's more than half of our number right there. 
we need 175,000 signatures. Now Pat's going to get 25, so that's down to 150. So those 100, then we're just going to need another 50. There are people, if you can do 500 signatures, Sam's going to have a roster and she's going to check boxes on how many people, you know, over as this campaign ripens. If you can get 250, you can get 100. I mean, my God, you can go to work and you can talk to your friends and family members. You can enlist others to get some signatures. This is just so doable, but you've got to step up. Got to, got to, got to take a little risk. You've got to make a commitment and think of what, you know, a lot of people say, oh my God, you know, I give money $25 here to a group or $50 here. Fabulous. You gather a thousand signatures at $5 a signature, which is what it would cost us to pay for it. You've given a $5,000 donation to the campaign. I mean, how good does charity feel? When you give a hundred dollars to to the wild animal sanctuary, or you give five hundred dollars to Big Cat Rescue, you give two hundred fifty dollars, or twenty five dollars, or ten dollars to a local humane organization, a wildlife rehab center. That feels good. Imagine how good you're going to feel if you save us five thousand dollars and then reach all those people. I think it's going to be incredible. I think you're going to feel really good. So think about making that commitment. And Lauren said it really well. She said, this is a once in a generation opportunity. You know, she and her organization, the people who are part of her, that organization, I can't think of Denver having other issues on the ballot on animals, Lauren. Has there been much on the ballot in Denver for animal protection ever in Colorado? Not that I'm aware of. Nothing, nothing this big, nothing this radical. And, and you know, when it comes to statewide ballots, so that was a local ballot measure, obviously the biggest jurisdiction, Denver in Colorado. So it's a, it's a big stage for sure. But this is an even bigger stage. The last animal protection measure in terms of stopping cruelty to animals was the 1996 measure to stop the use of body gripping traps, uh, steel jaw like hole traps, snares to kill animals for fur and recreation. Now, we mentioned the bobcats, they're being trapped. Well, they're being, we didn't even, when we did that ballot measure, we didn't anticipate that these trappers would be so ruthless that they put out cage traps and they capture the bobcats in cages and then they bludgeon them or strangle them when they come across them. Animals who've never known anything but freedom suddenly find themselves trapped and they know they're in a terrible situation. They bite the cage to get out of it. They struggle to get out of it. So, this, you know, since 1996, there hasn't been anything like this on the statewide ballot. That is 27 years. So maybe there's going to be one in two years, 10 years, 20 years, but no guarantees. This is an opportunity right now. We've got this opportunity this year coming in front of us, 2024. And Sam, I think we're probably going to start gathering signatures in February. And we're going to run from February through the end of July, basically. Probably end of February through the end of July. That's our six-month window. And I know Lauren was talking just to us in advance of this call starting, saying farmers markets were fabulously uh, good uh, venues for gathering signatures. Not milling inside. you got to stay outside. But the people who are conscious of their food choices, they understand the the world and that food comes from somewhere and from people they were paying attention and this is this is going to be a good sort of venue to gather signatures and uh i think you mentioned a jazz festival lauren that was also a really good um venue we'll find other good venues for you and we'll recommend you know a lot of people think oh you know obviously we're not going to have Broncos games from end of February to July. That's not the football season, but any big sporting event or any giant concert, you know, where there are 50,000 people or 60,000 people, you would think, oh my God, it's great. It actually turns out to be a really difficult uh, place to get signatures. All these crush of people come at once and you just can't, you just have very few touches with them. It's impossible. Plus they've got something else on their mind and it's a disaster. And like a little slow, steady stream of people where you know, there's a human interaction is a much better one. You know, if you're able to get in front of a Whole Foods market or a Trader Joe's or go to a jazz festival or a farmer's market, you'll find other venues. 
and you know your community and what would work, and then we'll help you with that. And yes. the process okay. of a, a campaign is about finding the best places and maximizing your time. Yeah, and I just wanted to echo what you're saying, that we will provide support on signature gathering as the campaign moves forward. And after this webinar, we will follow up with a way to register as a circulator for us. We'll provide you a Facebook group so we can support each other too. Um, you'll get a volunteer resources packet and that'll answer a lot of the questions that I've seen in the chat, um, which are specific to circulating the petition, which, you know, you have to be 18, you have to be a resident of the United States to circulate a petition. Um, you don't have to be a Colorado registered voter to circulate, but you do have to be to sign. Um, but we do have all of that outlined in a whole packet for you. So it'll be right at your fingertips. It's easier to have it in front of you in writing. And then you can really help us with that. Um, Wayne, are you ready to take a couple questions from the audience now? Yeah, please. Okay, absolutely. Um, so I think that, you know, what we've asked is, is why are people still trophy hunting? And do we have uh, wildlife biologists that can speak to the science and conservation? Great question. Yeah. I mean, listen, it's about 2000 people who participate uh, in these trophy hunts and many of them are from out of state. They're coming because Colorado is a beautiful, wild state. You've got a massive amount of public lands. As Pat said, you still have these native species uh, who are there. So, uh, you know, for most of us, like 99% of us, we think of that as a treasure. And uh, unfortunately, a yeah, small percentage of people think of it as, as an exploitation opportunity, right? They want to kill something. I mean, it's so it's so completely alien to me that someone would want to kill one of these remarkable animals. I mean, you know, we were talking before, or Lauren, you were talking about Jane Goodall. I mean, she inspired me. You know, Jane's been around a long time, so even you know when she was around, I was a, when I was a kid, she was a young woman, and I thought, my God, you're devoting yourselves to these creatures. What a beautiful thing this is, and uh, you know. Sam, you you, at, or you you repeated that question. Yes, we have a whole science team. We have professional wildlife biologists. We also have the experience from other states. The California banned trophy hunting of lions more than a half century ago. And they have no more in the way of negative interactions between lions and people or lions and, and uh, uh, agricultural animals than any other state. And lions are a are an apex predator, they're a low density species, they uh, are incredibly stealthy, they are smart, and they stay away from people. The ballot measure contains provisions to allow for the taking of animals when there's a very rare circumstance where they're even perceived um, as a threat. So really what this ballot measure is about is stopping the trophy hunting of unoffending lions lions who are going about their business, living their lives, and then somebody attacks them and six, you know, 10 or 12 dogs on them. This is not, you know, the occasional lion that ends up in trouble or, or kills cattle, you know, which is very rare. The ballot measure doesn't change the existing depredation laws that exist. This is about ending human attacks on unoffending animals, you know, killing an animal for no good reason, just for a trophy that we reject as a society. You know, we all remember Cecil or Cecil, the African lion, you know, some trophy hunter from Minnesota traveled halfway around the world and went to Zimbabwe and lured this male lion out of the national park and then shot him with an arrow and wounded the animal and then took another 12 hours, went home to go to sleep or went to a tent and slept and then had the animal suffering with a knife, the effective, I mean, effectively a knife wound all night and then shot him with a firearm in the morning. And this was the most watched animal, you know, of, of, of that species in the park. It was a beloved animal. And this guy went over there. Was he going to take the lion home and consume the lion? Of course not. Of course not. It's unthinkable. But these are lions too. This is our country. 98% of the people thought what that guy did, Walter Palmer, 
to that African lion was a horror. And that's happening in Colorado 500 times a year. Not the same exact circumstances, but the same unsporting, lopsided hunt for the absolute, you know, abysmal explanation that, you know, they're doing some wildlife management thing. It's just a euphemism. They're not. And I think that, you know, to speak to the science too, really Colorado Parks and Wildlife hasn't been following their own science which really showed that harvesting mountain lions at this level is unsustainable. And yet it continued because of institutionalized bias. You know, we have these institutions that were, were really created by, by hunters, by people who want to kill animals. And we've got to figure out how to really incorporate the emerging science that shows that uh, lions are effective in the fight against chronic wasting disease. And lions are, are really great ecosystem engineers. And we don't need to manage bobcats through killing them in traps. And so I think there's a lot of opportunities there too. Um, we are near the end of the hour. I have a small child who somehow managed to escape his bed. Um, so I'm going to get him off the camera. And Wayne, I'll hand it to you for closing remarks. And please feel free to follow up um, with questions to me in email too. And we will also be communicating, like I said, with more resources and points. So Wayne, yeah. I'll give it to you for closing remarks. Yeah, so Sam, tell us your email address so people can make sure they've got that. Your, they have questions, your, please. Uh, you're going to lose all your screens. <laughs> all right. My email address is samb at catsarenttrophies.org. Sam B, S-A-M, and then B is in Bruger. Yes. Uh, at cats aren't trophies uh with there's no there's no uh oh in there right right no, no it's cats um, aren't trophies right <laughs> sorry about that yes sam b at cats aren't trophies.org and there is no colon in there and i'm happy to connect with any of you yeah. And like I said, we'll be following up with an email that'll have a link to a whole folder of volunteer Good. resources. And Great. that includes our ballot language. It includes uh, frequently asked questions, a lot of um, which I saw echoed in the chat. And then a real detailed uh, informational packet on circulating and what you can and can't do. And then lastly, we're also creating a video um, that you can download and watch in your spare time about circulating. And we'll keep these webinars going. I think we've we've got one with Pat coming up soon, right, Pat, in, in January, and yeah. we'll we'll have uh, a lot more opportunities to engage. And I apologize for that temporary interruption that was uh, cured by gumballs. <laughs> so, so I'm not sure what our final number is tonight for people who registered for the webinar, but I think it was in more than 300. And some people were not able to join, but we're going to send them this this whole presentation and our discussion here. So if we get 25 or 30 people who commit to a thousand signatures, we're going to be off and running. So please, I hope you think about this. I hope you're one of those people who makes that commitment. If you can do 500, fantastic. We are, we're going to celebrate you for that 250, a hundred, any of those numbers, those are fabulous. And, uh, you know, you'll see over time that it's very, very doable. But this is just the first of dozens of events that we're going to be conducting throughout the state of Colorado. Uh, but maybe you have friends and family members who want to participate. Please make sure you sign up other people. You're the best network for us. 400 or 350 people tonight can turn into 700, you know, by the end of the week. And then from there, it just can, can ripple out. So let us know if you have organizations who or that you think can be involved or might wish to be involved, you can reach out to them, direct them to the website, talk to Sam, the rest of our team. And we just want to thank you for, for being part of this. And I want to thank Lauren so much uh, for all that you have done to put animals on the, on the Denver ballot, that every Denver resident is going to see animal protection very prominently next November. Uh, let's add to their uh, animal decision-making opportunities by putting this anti-trophy hunting measure for Denver, but then outside of Denver, everyone else in Colorado is going to have this opportunity. 
And I want to thank Carol Baskin for your incredible commitment to the big cats and for raising awareness about these animals throughout the United States. I want to thank Pat. The, you know, you have the number one, you know, by volume and, you know, by visitation, big cat sanctuary in the United States. I want to thank you for this incredible 40 year commitment that you've made. And I can't tell you how excited I am that you are involved in this effort and you're one of the leaders of it. My colleague, Julie Marshall, uh, has been an incredible voice for, for this ballot measure. And uh, uh, Deanna uh, Meyer is doing such incredible work. She's on the screen with a picture. She is so devoted to the big cats. Uh, Sam, I'm so glad you are fighting for these animals. Uh, we've got a great team. And this is just a small little set of the team members. And now tonight we have grown our team. We have grown our family and you're part of that. So thank you so much for, for being part of it. And we look forward to working with you. This is the first of many. Listen, let's remember it's December. So there's a new year's resolution opportunity and your resolution could be to gather a thousand signatures for this campaign. So thank you all very, very much. Grateful to you for participating.